morning and a very warm welcome to this EPC update, our regular look at developments in and around the European Union. My name is Jackie Davis. I'm a senior advisor to the European Policy Centre. And with me this week, as always, are Yanis Emanulidis, Director of Studies at the EPC and Chief Executive Fabian Zulik. And our special guest this week, joining us later on to discuss the latest developments on enlargement and the EU's neighbourhood, are Amanda Poole, Senior Policy Analyst at the EPC, and Corinna Stratulat, also Senior Policy Analyst and Head of the European Politics and Institutions Programme at the EPC. As always, totally interactive discussion, questions from me, and I hope also from all of you. If you want to speak, please click on the raised hands button, and when the time comes, I will allow you to talk and ask you to unmute yourself. If you want to write your question, use the Q&A button, and please be as brief as you possibly can. We're going to start uh, with a little bit of an update on where we are with COVID. We're going to look at the state of play in the COP26 negotiations, and we're going to touch on that old chestnut Brexit EU-UK relations, uh, and then we'll bring in Corinna and Amanda. But Yanis, uh, just in terms of, of COVID, we see an alarming picture at the moment. Many member states appear to have begun a fourth wave. Uh, cases are going up. Do you think that overall, this time around, there will be a more coordinated response to this fourth wave? Uh, or is it likely to be as fragmented as it has in the past? And if it is, what is the significance of that? Well, first of all, you're right. Um, if you see the situation in the member states throughout the European Union, you see that the situation is worsening, numbers are going up. Um, hospitalizations are unfortunately also going up, um, but you also see that it is working with mathematical precision. Epidemiologists were telling us from the second October, uh, second half of October onwards, the situation uh, will be uh, getting worse, will be uh, becoming again very negative. Um, and they are also now telling us that the situation will not improve over the upcoming weeks and months. So we have another COVID winter in front of us. Although the situation obviously is better because we have so many of us who are vaccinated, uh, we have also better medicine when it comes to treatment of COVID-19. So the situation is better than it had been in the previous winter, but still it is it is Better not in some situation. member states than others, though, because vaccination yes. rates in some member states are still incredibly low. Yes, and that is not really changing. If you look into the development over the past weeks, and we have been discussing vaccination numbers, um, in those countries which are below average, the increase in vaccination is extremely slow. And you have countries like Romania and Bulgaria, who, where the numbers are very low. And now you can see that also, you know, deaths per millions are increasing are very high in these countries. So we clearly have what everyone was telling us that those countries where you have low vaccination rates, where you don't have uh, people being fully vaccinated, the numbers are high. And also, unfortunately, the numbers of people ending up in hospitals are high. Mm. Now you are asking, have, do we have a coordinated approach? Um, we never really had one. Yeah. Um, and we already we also see now that member states and even regions in those in federal countries decides on their own on how to deal with the worsening situation on the ground. However, having said that, you have an implicit shared reaction scheme of how member states are reacting. Um, they are all trying to avoid uh, lockdowns. And this is what they really want to not have this time around compared to last winter. Absolutely. They're increasing the pressure on those who are not vaccinated. And they're they are accepting an increasing number of people being infected by COVID as long as hospitals can be able to cope with it. And there is the question, how long will in certain countries will be hospitals able to cope? And if not, where that will lead us to. And just one follow up question before I bring Fabian in um, on the COVID digital certificate, which has been, I think, a resounding success this summer and has been evidence to people that if you are part of the EU, that this has been a huge advantage. You had a certificate, you could travel. But now we're beginning to see uh, differences because of differences in approach to the necessity or not for booster jabs. For example, this week or last week, Austria and Croatia have put time limits on the validity of the double jab. So your pass will run out unless you have a booster. Other countries saying booster is not necessary for the whole population. Is there a risk that this big success enabling free movement uh, within uh, the EU, if you have a COVID digital certificate, will be undermined by differences on policies such as booster jabs? There is a risk. There is a risk if the situation 
worsens in certain countries enormously, and then they will be uh, dragged into a situation to put up measures, which then also include measures where you ask as to whether someone is fully vaccinated, if he or she has been, has, has had two jabs, or whether you know, that person needs to have three. But I think that the, the overall situation, if you take a bird's eye view on the EU, depends on how the situation will develop. If we reach a situation and I'm knocking on wood that that will not happen. What if we reach a situation where numbers increase enormously until December or January and knock on woods that we don't move from Delta to Epsilon as we have been saying in the past. And if we don't have that, I think that we will be able to stick to a system which is still functioning, but it will get under pressure as the numbers are increasing yet. Thank you, and Fabian, alongside this fourth wave as it appears to be, the economic recovery is also faltering um you know there was surprise at how well economies had rebounded uh, but we're now uh, in a much more difficult it would appear that that was a bit of a false dawn where are we now on that well i think the the difficulty here is really um what we want about um quite quite a few months ago that uh, there was inevitably going to be some kind of rebound after um some of the restrictions are lifted um Basically, you had during the lockdown period, you had a lot of activity bottled up. And the moment you then uh, lift those restrictions, that activity can start again. So you're getting a, a rather positive boost for, for the economy. But it was a temporary boost. Now we're seeing the longer term dip, which follows after that. Uh, we are also seeing that, um, and particularly for Europe, this has always been the case, uh, that we are not insulated from what is happening globally. Uh, that, for example, the energy prices are having an impact, um, that we are also seeing that growth performance in some other parts of the world are not um, uh, recovering as strongly as was hoped for. So uh, I think what we are seeing is um, a more difficult period which we will have to handle. Um, and again, with very strong distributional aspects. Um, mm -hmm. Some places will do much better than others. And that will raise also the question of what can we do uh, in the short term to help those countries where the economies are not performing well. And we should recall here that uh, even though it was a very great success uh, that we have the resilience and recovery facility, um, this is mainly for investment in the longer term. This is not something which is going to help uh, the countries in the immediate future. The short term measures inevitably taken mainly at national level. Um, let's uh, move on. Uh, and if we could, Fabian, uh, assess where we are with COP26. Uh, we're halfway through. Uh, now, before the meeting began, we saw the British government really trying to downplay some of the expectations, uh, warning it was looking very difficult. Then towards the end of last week, we seem to have a remarkable burst of optimism, claims that they'd done enough already to bring the increase down to 1.7 and so on. And now we're seeing some cold water poured on that. Mm, not necessarily, we're not as far as we need to be. What's your assessment of where we really are when you strip away the hype and the spinning? Of course, we're still in the middle of it. Um, so hopefully uh, we are not at the end in terms of what comes out of COP. Um, there needs to be more. Uh, there's still some big issues on, on the table. But the question really is, um, do I agree with Greta Thunberg, uh, who was basically saying this is a failure, uh, it's a PI event, it's blah, blah, blah. Um, and unfortunately, um, in many ways it is. Um, I think what has become clear, despite all the noise, despite all uh, the, the spinning, which of course is always there uh, when we talk about a big political summit like this, um, it looks like 1.5 degrees is out of reach already, and that we are already talking about uh, how do we manage that? Uh, how do we limit it further? What we're also not seeing is uh, that the countries are really committing to systemic change, um, to the big changes which are necessary. Um, we are seeing a lot of pledges, um, even those are falling short uh, of what is needed. Uh, but what we have is pledges, not plans, um, with very few exceptions. And um, we have a very limited buy-in 
globally. Um, when we see which leaders chose not to come, when we see what uh, is emanating from some countries, mm -hmm. yes, they are all making the right sounds, the rhetoric is there, but the reality, unfortunately, is falling short. That doesn't mean uh, that we're making no progress. Um, there, there is some progress in some areas. It is important that this is happening. And I would say what it does show is that there now is a global consensus, that something has to be done. But I think the reality is that this is not the moment when it's going to be done. Um, and the best we can hope for is that it is a stepping stone to something further, uh, rather than being in some way an endpoint where we are getting to uh, where we need to be. But given, <laughs> given uh, Yanis, uh, Fabian saying there's some progress in some areas, there are people working very hard at the COP negotiations to make progress who've really taken, uh, I don't think offence is the right word, but are quite angered by um, Greta Thunberg with her, it's just more blah, blah, blah. Uh, saying this isn't easy, it's hard, we're working at it, and we're getting somewhere, so you can't just dismiss it. Where do you fall on the spectrum of doing the bare minimum, falling well short? How, what is your assessment of where we are? Given the gravity of the situation and all the promises which are coming from all scientists, um, we are falling short. Uh, we don't have uh, the luxury of uh, saying... Uh, and Fabian is right in his analysis, but actually we don't have the uh, luxury of saying this is a stepping stone to something which will be more ambitious in future because it's time that counts and time's, time is of essence. Um, so yes, I think there are still a lot of thorny issues which need to be discussed and we can go into more detail about what these are. Uh, but even if they agree on them, um, we will not moving fast enough. Um, and thus those, um, and it's not only Greta Thunberg, eh? it's also others who are very critical of what is happening in Glasgow, who are also very disappointed about what is happening in Glasgow, are putting pressure on all of us. Um, and what Obama did uh, in his speech uh, was also putting pressure on the younger generation to put pressure on us, on the others, uh, on governments, on all those who are not ready uh, to go the extra mile at this present point in time. And I think this is the right approach and you need that pressure uh, because without that pressure, nothing will be moving. And unfortunately, and I think that's different from what we've seen in the past, it's also the rhetoric and the symbolism, which is rather low. The fact that the presidents, that the leaders uh, of, of China, Russia, um, are not coming to the are not coming to the summit is a very negative sign. So it's it's not only that you have low expectations and low results. It's also that the public pressure, the symbolism, the rhetoric is even behind what we should be doing. And what is maybe what, maybe to to yeah. add to that because I think um, the when when we look at how it was set up this time around, it's interesting to see that the UK has chosen to put the leaders up front rather than mm -hmm. at the end. Mm. Um, and I think this is, uh, in my reading, this is a choice which was made because there wasn't the expectation that there would be the grand negotiation like we had seen at Paris at the end, where then after, you know, one, two nights, three nights, uh, the leaders come up with, we have now find, found an agreement, we have moved forward. So in a sense, we already managed uh, a situation which we knew wouldn't produce uh, what it, it was needed. And I fully agree with you, Anis. The problem is we know that more is needed, um, but we also know that this is not going to deliver it. So uh, th this puts us in a very difficult situation globally so because we have to now mm -hmm. deal with unfortunately 1.5 being out of reach in my opinion. Mm. So if the leaders had come at the end, it would have suggested there was some tough negotiating to do that only they could do because this would be highest political level compromise and so on. They're not coming back means no one expects that to happen. What are the most difficult issues? What are the thorniest issues, Yanis? One, one remark yeah. to what you just said. Because I think that, and I'm trying to be fair now, because as you said, there are a lot of people who are trying their best to get something out of Glasgow um, in view also of what comes after that and was was before that. Um, and the, But it's more about making sure that what had been agreed in Paris is being implemented. 
So the attitude is about, you know, minimizing the risk of a low ambition implementation of Paris rather than securing higher ambition yeah. of what we actually need in the current situation. Uh, in terms of the, the hottest potatoes, I think uh, there, it's uh, deadlines, transparency, carbon market and financial support. Uh, the deadlines relate to the fact that members that countries have submitted their five year plans, but there's no specific deadlines for implementing the targets which they have agreed on. So there is a discussion about having a common time framework with unified deadlines and the developed countries are saying we need unified deadlines of five years. And that includes also the European Union and others developing countries, but also China saying we need more time, 10 years or more flexible more flexibility. Then it's about transparency, about making sure that you have uh, regular reviews and the submission of progress reports on what's happening in the member states and that you have stringent and unified rules with respect to that because there's a fear that some countries are not sufficiently transparent. And there's the word going around even of cheating on what they're actually doing on the ground. And then there's the most thorniest issue, which is um, the carbon market discussion about having a new international carbon market um, where the discussion is about um, as to whether you would have rules on how countries can achieve climate target via carbon markets. Um, but there are, again, very thorny issues here about countries who hold, um, who hold credit, carbon credits from the past and they want to also use in a new system that includes countries like Brazil. And there's the risk of double counting, uh, which at the end of the day doesn't help the, the situation if you have some countries yeah. who are reducing emission that selling these emission rights and others uh, are claiming that they are uh, cutting down their emissions. So you're double counting. Okay. So you see there are a lot of thorny issues which still need to be overcome, which are technical, they are important, but they're probably not enough. And Fabian is right. Um, 1.5 seems more and more out of reach. Great. Fabian, one last question on this. The EU has always boasted of its leadership role in this area. Is it playing that leadership role uh, in Glasgow? And if so, how is it seeking to do that? And in terms of impacts on its own policy, is the case that whatever is agreed, if anything is agreed at the end of Glasgow, the EU is doing more anyway, so it doesn't affect policies like uh, the Green Deal, Fit for 55, etc. Or could it have an impact on the EU's own policies? I, th I think by and large, um, the EU um, has been um, more at the forefront of this. This is not to say that there are not many more things which need to be done also at EU level. Um, but yes, the EU uh, has been uh, one of the, the, the parts of the world which have been pushing for more, um, but clearly there are also implications and some of these implications um, are still among the thorny issues which Yanis was also mentioning. I mean, one of the, the key things, for example, which still needs to be um, resolved is the question of climate finance and uh, what kind of transfer is there between uh, the richer countries which tended to have used the carbon in the past to grow and uh, those countries which are still developing. So there is a lot more which needs to be done. But uh, I think undoubtedly also the outcome of, of COP26, and I, I think there will be some positive outcomes as well. So I'm not negative about that. And a lot of the work which is done there is important um, also in areas maybe are not so much in the headlines, yeah. but uh, methane, deforestation, um, the financial sector. I mean, these are important outcomes. Um, but I think um, we will also have to face a situation where, for example, when it comes to carbon budgets, um, do we need the carbon border adjustment mechanism if uh, some other parts of the world are not doing um, what is needed uh, to reduce their carbon use? So. Uh, I think this is going to be something uh, which will influence our um, our policies, uh, but it's not going to weaken our commitments in the European Thank you. Yanis, yeah, you want to come in a quick one, if you would, because we then need just, to move just, on. Just very short. I think we have a, a problem of distrust. Um, and that is also affecting the European Union. What Fabian was mentioning in the end, when it, com when it comes to financial support, we had committed ourselves already in Copenhagen as developing countries, including obviously also the European Union member states, that we would be able, that we, will, that we would support by 100, million, 100 billion, sorry, dollars by 2020 onwards. And we haven't reached that goal and we're postponing it. And there are discussions of what happens after 2025 and others are asking themselves, can you trust the so-called developed countries when they're not sticking to their commitments. 
And I think the European Union also has a problem because others are witnessing what is happening within the EU and how much we are already in the process of struggling with respect to the Green Deal. And the discussion we've had on energy prices, which we discussed at the last update, is just showing how difficult it becomes when you get to the nitty gritty of, of things. And that I think is undermining trust in us and thus also the leverage of the EU in these negotiations and potentially also in future. Okay, while well, we're on the topic of distrust, let us turn to EU-UK relations. Uh, it looks, Fabian, as if we are inching closer towards what people are now describing as a trade war. We have increasing hints, increasing speculation that once COP26 is over, the government will trigger Article 16 uh, and hints uh, from the Irish and from others that the EU could retaliate by withdrawing from the trade and cooperation agreement, which wouldn't, uh, which would take a year, but nevertheless would be the start of, you've warned many times on update that things were going to get much worse before they got better. Is there any way now of averting the prospect of a trade war? Um well, let, let me start with firstly to, to make a link back um, to COP26, um, because I think this is important also to reflect that at a time when we ought to be making progress on the global issues like climate change, um, we are not, and in part we are not, because of the difficulties in the relationship between the EU and the UK. Because what we would have needed uh, is a strategic approach of the developed world, uh, including the US as well, um, to go into this with already a plan, with already commitments, um, that hasn't happened. And in part that is because the relationship between the EU and the UK is at a very low ebb. Now, will the UK trigger Article 16? Um, it has often been threatened uh, that uh, they will use this well, you could call it a nuclear option because it is quite far reaching in terms of uh, what the response also would be from the EU side. Um, but I think this time around, there are reasons why it might. Uh, after COP, uh, it will not have the need, um, but or already um, threatening this at this time already influences the trust within the COP negotiations as well. So it's already having an impact there. Um, but also um, there's the domestic situation in the UK, uh, mm -hmm. the, the um, well, what looks like rampant corruption um, from any perspective um, is also now affecting the opinion polls, it's affecting the position of Johnson as a leader. So Brexit might once again be uh, the chosen method of distracting from um, what is happening uh, mm -hmm. at the domestic level. If that happens, we are in trade war territory. Uh, we will call it different things. Uh, we will try to be measured, um, particularly from the EU institution side. But there are red lines which will be crossed uh, if the UK goes there. And that also will have an impact on domestic politics in the EU. Uh, mm -hmm. It will have an impact in France. And we're already seeing the issues around fisheries. Um, around uh, generally that relationship and how it's playing out. Um, we are seeing a new government coming in in Germany, which probably will have a different take. So I think we are uh, at the moment at a very, very precarious point. You talk, about, you talk about the German government having a different take. Uh, I have seen in the last few days the revival of that. Oh, the EU wouldn't possibly retaliate by withdrawing from the trade and cooperation agreement because the Germans won't have it. I seem to remember similar conversations about the German car industry uh, back by David Davis a long time ago. History repeating itself over and over again, only with more tragedy every time. Thank you for that. Let us bring in our guest this week, uh, senior policy analysts Amanda Paul and Corinna Stratulat. Uh, a very warm welcome to both of you. And Corinna, if I could start with you, I uh, want to talk about enlargement first of all. All, you have written this week a rather scathing commentary about the EU's current approach towards enlargement. It was published yesterday. Do take a look, ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't read it already. And you basically pointing out that the, the Bordeaux summit really very grudging on the European perspective, one mention of the E word, and you said that was almost impossible to get to. And you say it's sending the wrong, the promises that it made are ringing hollow. 
What is your assessment now of why we are where we are and what it means both for the EU and the Western Balkans? Thank you. Thank you so much, Jackie, and um, happy to be back uh, with you here on EPC's update. Um, indeed, um, EU leaders had to, to really haggle over the mention of the word um, enlargement and only agreed to, to include it in the final um, uh, declaration on the explicit condition that the Union's own capacity to take in new members would also be cited. Um, the fact that, that they would make such a fuss um, about semantic um, to me stands at odds with, with all the beating of breasts in, in, in Brussels and EU capitals that enlargement is credible, um, is strategic, uh, and that the union is committed to it. In fact, quite the opposite seems to be the message. There is disunity rather than unequivocal support among member states for the European perspective uh, of the region. So what happened in Slovenia I would say can be read as a clear indication that not all member states agree anymore on the end result of this process in which so much has already been invested. And from this perspective, of course, the implications um, are very worrying because a technical process as strict and as rigorous as it has become for the Balkans can never suffice to complete enlargement if it is not backed by political resolve and by a compelling vision of a joint future. Mm -hmm. We can express as, as much rhetorical commitment as, as we want. Uh, and of course, it is important to do so. But member states also have to put their money where their mouth is. Otherwise, the talk starts, as you say, to, to ring hollow and, and it fails to inspire or, or engage the region with, with much needed reforms and in a transformative process. And you, you point out in your, your commentary that, that, in fact, the Western Balkans are diverging from the EU, far from mm -hmm. converging. And for you, is that a result of, of this, if you like, very tough, you have, you know, these are the requirements, this is the conditionality, and then our promises are rather vague. Has mm -hmm. the EU therefore lost its transformative leverage? Well, I mean, data and even the latest uh, country reports that uh, were released by the European Commission last month certainly don't point in the direction of, of convergence. After almost um, two decades now of European integration, democratic performance throughout the region has not yet acquired a positive dynamics, despite the primacy of, of democratic conditionality uh, in the methodology that we apply to the region. Serious problems with the rule of law, independence of the judiciary, media freedom, the fight against corruption and organized crime persist throughout the Balkans, including in um, what we call front, front running countries like, like Montenegro and Serbia. Likewise, sobering economic prospects, um, widespread poverty and inequality, and the lack of opportunities, all of which have been, of course, exacerbated by COVID-19, are also placing the region uh, on, I would say, a centrifugal trajectory with the EU. And of course, uh, uh, war-torn, multi-ethnic, post-communist countries um, like, the Balkan, um, like the Western Balkan countries are, had many cards stuck against them uh, before they even began to try to catch up with the EU. And the EU, of course, did not and does not have ready-made solution to many of the, of the regional and country-specific challenges posed by the Balkans, like resolving statehood or reconciliation issues. But the lukewarm commitment of the member states certainly, I would say, doesn't help an, an already complicated in, um, engagement. Mm, thank you. Um, what are the consequences then if the EU, and I'd like to come back, Corinna, to whether there is some alternative uh, to the current approach, given that member states aren't ready to live up to their commitments, do we need to change tack? But before I do that, uh, in terms of this failure to keep the promises, um, Amanda, you're here really to talk about the direct neighbourhood. I don't know whether you want to come in on this uh, point and then I'll come to Yanis and Fabian, but does this have wider implications, Amanda, do you think, uh, for the EU's neighbourhood if the EU can't get this right. Yes, absolutely, it does. I mean, it's important that the EU keeps the promises that it's made uh, to the countries of the Western Balkans. Um, it didn't keep the promise it made to Turkey, um, but it sends a very negative message to other countries in the neighborhood, Ukraine, Moldova, uh, Georgia, the other countries in the South Caucasus. They're not, they're not member um, candidates. 
um, but they're still sort of aiming to carry out democratic reform, et cetera, in order to have a closer relationship with the EU and the EU has promised them certain things. Uh, so if promises aren't kept to the countries in the Balkans, uh, question marks start to appear, you know, why should we bother? Uh, the EU is not a reliable partner. We can't trust the EU. Thank you very much. And, and Yanis, from your perspective, the Slovenian president, uh, who we had at the EPC annual conference uh, a couple of weeks ago, and Corinna was in debate uh, with him, he talked about this now as a matter of peace and security for the whole region. Is that how you see it? And how serious will it be if the EU doesn't rethink its approach? Well, I think that we have and are committing a strategic mistake. I think we're extremely short-sighted as EU member states, as national capitals, uh, in the way how we have been treating the Western Balkan countries, how we are treating the enlargement process. Um, it is undermining our, um, our credibility. And I would even go further than Amanda, who very explicitly said this is having an effect on the wider neighborhood. I think it's also having a, an, a wider effect than that, because it's showing that what kind of a credible actor can you be also internationally if you're not able to commit to to your own promises. Um, yes, these were conditioned promises, and they were also conditioned on the ability of the EU to reform itself, and obviously of the countries concerned to reform themselves, but still there were commitments and there were promises which have been made. And now we are backtracking, not now, for years we are backtracking on what we have said we would do. And then come all those who actually never wanted enlargement to say, look, these countries are moving in the wrong direction. Um, we, we always said they shouldn't become members, and now it's proving that we're right. Well, it's a chicken and egg situation. Exactly. And, that, and that's also, by the way, if you, because uh, Amanda was referring to uh, promises not kept also in the Turkish case. And I remember uh, 10, 15 years ago when there were discussions about uh, the, per, the, the, the prospect for Turkey, and there were some member states, one I know rather well, who was criticized for, for obstructing the process. Um, and then you got to the, to the moment where actually crunch time was approaching, and then others were backtracking and making the same mistakes. And so if there is a hen and egg problem, um, but it's undermining credibility of us in the region and beyond that. Thank you. Fabian, I know you want to come back in, Corinna, and I want to come back to you, but Fabian, a quick thought on, on how serious this is for the EU. Would you echo what's been said? Yeah, I would fully agree with that. I think uh, the difficulty here is uh, it really doesn't matter whether you agree or not. Um, I, I think it is a political reality um, which we have to face, um, which is not going to change in the near future. Um, and that also means that we have to think about what kind of tools do we have available um, to uh, deal with relationships with countries in our neighborhood, because membership as a tool which also has been used um, to achieve compliance with uh, particular EU policies to make sure that uh, countries are bound um, to the European Union because their final uh, trajectory is membership, mm -hmm. that doesn't work anymore. So we are going to have to think differently about how we deal with that. And this is a geopolitical question. This is something which really matters. Um, and uh, we've had also these discussions at the update before that the European Union is trying to become more of a geopolitical actor. Well, if we don't manage uh, handling this kind of situation in our neighborhood with relatively small countries, which are relative, uh, highly dependent on the European Union, then how, what hope can we have <laughs> to act as a bigger actor uh, in some of the, the other geopolitical gains which are going Absolutely. And Corinna, you said, and I'm quoting in your commentary, maybe the EU should abandon approaches that create polarization and find new way ways to deal with the region as us. What did you mean by that? And is it time now to start talking about alternatives for membership where promises can be made that have a realistic chance of being kept? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I will answer that, but I just wanted to add another uh, issue that is at stake beyond peace and, 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 and security. Um, a there is a recent uh, public opinion poll that was commissioned by Balkans in Europe Policy Advisory Group, and which shows that as much as 54% of, uh, percent of respondents in Serbia and 46% um, in North Macedonia expect their countries to join the club only after 2041 or never at all. Moreover, 57% of respondents in all Balkan countries perceive economic development rather than 
EU membership as more important. Most notably, a relative majority of Serbian citizens see closer economic integration with the EU short of full membership as the preferred type of relationship with the EU. Therefore, uh, what we're seeing is also that citizens in the Balkan countries themselves seem to be starting to adapt a transactional view of EU accession and are moving away from perceiving EU enlargement as transformative. And I have to, re to um, uh, recall here that uh, Hungary and Poland also had a rather transactional view of enlargement before they became members and look where that uh, brought us. So if people are not on board anymore with the goal of this process, when already the will of many political uh, elites in the region is, is questioned, then what can we hope to achieve? Commitment to reforms, therefore, is also at stake. And I wanted to emphasize that. I and mean, that, that goes to my question the... about thinking about alternatives. If they're thinking about alternatives, the EU should be. And what did you mean when you said yeah. new ways to deal with the region as us? Well, I mean, people have already started to look at, um, um, at alternatives and uh, the integration of the region in stages, for example, is emerging now as, as, a, as, as a, re a relatively popular option. However, I think we should watch out for two risks or two perils in such proposals. First, that the ultimate goal, which is full membership uh, for all these countries, is not diluted because otherwise the process will be de deprived of its key incentive for the aspirants to reform. And second, Second, that we don't fall in the trap of reforming the process every year or every other year. The new methodology is already very uh, of, or of recent making. So we shouldn't forget instead that the political will in the member states and also in the region is the real enemy. So if we want to brainstorm, we should brainstorm um, uh, or we should focus the brainstorming on how to get EU capitals to imagine and believe in a future um, European Union that includes the Balkans. If, okay. if that will is generated, then a, a way will follow. And to do that, to get that, it's certainly not by focus, focusing on what sets us apart from the Balkans, uh, focusing constantly on their problems or on treating these countries as outsiders when, for example, we don't invite them to the Conference on the Future okay. of Europe. When we do that, our common ground, common interests, common destiny will obviously be overshadowed by prejudice and, and, and the risks that these countries supposedly pose to the union. Uh, and such in and out of group differentiations are polarizing and, and polarization, we know that polarization polar, polarization bejets more polarization all the time. And this sabotages okay. all our efforts or best intentions. So we should find ways to deal with the region as us. And it's not so difficult because we, we, we share so many common interests and problems uh, with the region. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's a very quick one because then I want to uh, bring Amanda in and talk about uh, some of the <laughs> many issues uh, facing us uh, in our direct neighborhood. But Yanis, you wanted to come in. Unfortunately, I feel that um, only if the situation in one or the other country in the Western Balkans worsens, will we open our eyes and think more creatively about mm -hmm. the mistakes we are committing over the past years. And knock on wood, it won't happen, but that's what it probably needs because this is how we then start thinking. Second point relates to alternatives below full membership. I remember thinking about that already 15 years ago. And I advise people to read a new paper which has come out by, which was produced, co produced by the CAP in, in Belgrade, um, which is a, a paper which is trying to develop alternatives below full membership. And I think we need that discussion in order to clear our minds, because if you think of alternatives below full membership, you will soon realize that there are not so many which are actually credible and which will be um, really credible also from the EU's perspective, because it, it, it always entails two things. Whatever, however far you go and the different grades of how far you can go, it entails more money coming from the EU to these countries, which already is a problem. Yeah. And second, it entails also that you open your institutions uh, to countries who are not yet full members. And that was a problem 15 years ago when we were discussing about alternatives. And by the way, also when we were discussing issues related to the UK, that does, doesn't work. Uh, and I remember when I was thinking about alternatives to full membership, I was told either you're, either you're pregnant or you're not pregnant. There's nothing in between. However, having that discussion is probably necessary in order to clear our minds about actually what we mean okay. or what we don't mean. 
Thank you. Uh, Amanda, I want to, sorry, Fabian, unless you have a burning point to make, I want to move. Let us move because we have a number of issues to discuss. I want to talk about Turkey. I want to talk about Belarus. And I want to talk about Russia and the energy crisis. Um, Turkey first. Uh, we've already mentioned it. Uh, Amanda, things are in a pretty dire state. We saw uh, that um, declaring of 10 ambassadors as persona non grata, six from EU member states over uh, the persecution of the businessman Osman Kavala. We saw the Commission's report on enlargement accusing Turkey of backsliding of serious democratic shortfalls. This provoked an angry response from Turkey. Things, how, just how bad are things and is there any prospect of them improving? Thanks, Jackie. I mean, in, in fact, relations with Turkey have been problematic. Um, for a long time. You could always call, almost call it a perma crisis, if I can use that slogan. <laughs> um, and I think this is well reflected in this uh, report that you just mentioned. I mean, in terms of fundamental rights and freedoms, um, things in Turkey continue to go downhill. Um, there's areas of Turkish foreign policy that have been very problematic um, for the EU. Um, when you look at domestically Turkey today, I mean, a lot of this is driven by domestic politics and the fact that there's very important elections on the horizon in 2023. So all of the decisions that are made by uh, President Erdogan are about shoring up his support. Uh, he himself and his party are now at their lowest ever ratings, I think around 30%. Uh, and if we look at the, the economic situation in the country, I mean, it's dire. Um, inflation is um, soaring, unemployment rates are very high, food prices are in increasingly high as well. Um, so we're basically seeing a fight for um, political survival, uh, and this is being you know, played out in the domestic uh, and foreign policy, including uh, with the EU. Uh, so I expect that you know, looking ahead, the situation with the EU is going to remain um, very bumpy. Um, that said, um, this year has not been as bad as last year. Uh, last year, Turkey-EU relations really hit uh, an all-time low. Um, so about one year ago, they introduced what's called a positive agenda to try and bring some you know, new momentum or calm to, to relations. Uh, and over the last year, there have been some positive developments. I mean, there's been no more escalation in the Eastern Mediterranean. Things are still calm. Um, Turkey uh, and Greece are still engaged in um, conversations with each other under the auspices of NATO. There's been a lot of high level dialogues that have taken place between the EU and Turkey on everything from migration to climate change to digitalization. These are things that had been cancelled in the past. Um, so this is all very positive. Um, but I mean, as I said, going forward, uh, I think if you look to next year, I mean, there's a number of of indicators that don't bode, bode well. First of all, the, the change of leadership in Germany, um, this is, will impact um, on Turkey's uh, relationship with the EU because Angela Merkel was always very pragmatic. Um, she was a driving force behind this uh, positive agenda and, and Turkey could sort of rely on her. Um, yeah. And also the incoming French presidency um, definitely doesn't bode well um, for Turkey. I mean, Turkey's always um, an issue in, in, um, in, in French politics. You have the French uh, presidential elections where Turkey will be used for uh, election uh, fodder. Um, so it okay. will remain very bumpy. Thank you. And just, just linking it to our conversation earlier about enlargement, uh, Turkey's reaction, as I mentioned to the, the last enlargement report from the Commission in October, was to say Turkey maintains in the strongest terms its strategic choice of full EU membership. But Amanda, is it time to sort of <laughs> acknowledge the reality, which is this is going nowhere. Indeed, the Commission report says the negotiations are at a standstill, but that this really cannot be the perspective now. They're not going to get anywhere, certainly not uh, for the foreseeable future, and, and uh, approach this differently. Well, I mean, frankly speaking, Turkey weren't really going anywhere from the first day that they started the accession True. talks because they were doomed to fail. Um, but I mean, there's no, there's no, um, there's no appetite um, in Turkey for a different sort of relationship with the EU. I mean, the leadership um, continues to insist that membership 
um, is the only way forward. Um, I don't expect this to change. I mean, it's actually very difficult to, to sort of see what other deal the EU could actually put on the table for Turkey. That said, from the side of the EU, there's also no desire to formally end this, uh, this membership process, even though it's been dead for many years. I mean, association agreement, that's not going to work. Turkey already had that. They've already got a customs union. Um, albeit that's problematic. Um, so it's very difficult to find a sort of alternative. And even if there was an alternative, I mean, from a, from a Turkish perspective, I mean, the, the criteria that apply today, um, you know, human rights, fundamental rights and freedoms, etc., would still apply uh, in any sort of new agreement. So just because um, you would change this process to another one, that wouldn't get rid uh, of the problems that exist in this in this relationship. Thank you. Corinne, can I just ask Corinna, how does the Western Balkans view uh, this discussion about Turkey? And, and again, that prospect in dead, in, as Amanda has said, negotiations that have been dead for years, but nevertheless, membership being the ostensible objective. Is there a connection? How do they see the situation between EU and Turkey? Well, I mean, I don't know how they, they perceive the relationship between the EU and Turkey, but certainly the fact that um, the EU, or better said, the member states are so hesitant with respect to, um, uh, to enlargement certainly opens up the possibility for uh, other actors, uh, Turkey, Russia, China, and so on, to uh, um, interfere and mess up the EU's plans uh, in the region. Certainly, these kind of uh, ties and relationships are strengthened, and, and, and the EU's, EU's attitude certainly plays a role in it. Mm, thank you. Fabian, Yanis, where do we go from here on Turkey? Turkey. Fabian? Uh, it's very difficult. Um, I, I think uh, we have to recognize that, yes, the, the process isn't going anywhere. But on the other hand, um, Turkey is an important country. It has a strategic significance, um, also a strategic significance in a region which is very volatile. Um, so we can't not deal with Turkey. Um, we have to find some form of modus operandi. But I think the, the greatest hope uh, is that things change internally. Um, mm -hmm. There are some signs uh, that uh, there is movement, but Amanda is much better um, able to comment on that than I am. Um, but I think that's for the European Union would be uh, the most positive way of, of looking at what, what can happen, that we might have a, a Amanda, internal leadership. change in Turkey that could make a difference, or is that a, a sort of forlorn hope? Well, I mean, I think this is sort of wishful thinking. It's a bit like um, how EU leaders are waiting for President Putin to leave. Um, of course, there's an election, perhaps there'll be a leadership change in Turkey, um, but we shouldn't take that for granted. I mean, the guy's a political animal, uh, despite the fact that he may seem like he's on his way out now. This has been the case before, maybe not as bad as it is today, but if anybody can fight their way out of a difficult corner, um, it's President Erdogan. I mean, what the EU needs to have is a, you know, a common policy on Turkey, you know, a strategic vision um, for Turkey, which has been missing um, for, for many years, uh, and look for a way to take relations forward in, in a pragmatic sense. Um, you're never going to find a perfect way out of this crisis, but I mean, they need to have, I would say, a greater dose of pragmatism. Absolutely. Um, not allow certain individual member states to actually derail the process, because this has been a problem um, for many years. Individual member states, who I'm not going to mention here, but we all know who they are, um, have been driving to a large extent um, the policy with, with Turkey, which has had a, a, a devastating um, effect. I mean, that doesn't take us, take us away from the fact that internal developments in Turkey um, have been going in the wrong direction, um, but there needs to be a greater pragmatism uh, and a greater political will from both sides to move things forward. Thank you. Sorry, we're going to have to move on, Corinna. I want to move on. Uh, you mentioned Russia, so let's touch on that and then come back, because I also want to talk about Belarus. But you mentioned President Putin um, and the energy crisis. I'd just like to come back to that, Yanis. Um, in terms of, so Russia has been accused of, of playing its part uh, in exacerbating this energy crisis, using it as a political we weapon and, in, and, in, and intentionally withholding supplies. That has uh, prompted a reaction from President Putin saying it's politically motivated tittle-tattle and complete rubbish. What's the truth? What role is Russia playing and, and how, how can the EU respond to this? How is it responding? 
muted at the moment, my dear. Yep, sorry for that. And obviously, uh, when you uh, have uh, an energy crisis, um, it is in a political element there to it. So denying it doesn't even make sense. Now, the question is as to uh, why we have this energy price crisis. It's not only uh, because of uh, the politics in Moscow, um, but it's also because of the politics in Moscow. Fabian was referring to earlier to the COVID-19 situation and how um, the, the, the economic uh, rebounds has, has had an effect, which is also affecting energy prices. So it is multifactorial, multidimensional of why we have, why we are now in the, in, in the situation with respect to the energy uh, situation. And Russia obviously plays a strong role here. And we are having difference among ourselves. And Amanda, I'm sure is going to be alluding to that of how we deal with Russia. And we've had mm -hmm. these differences uh, for a long time and they're playing out. And, and if I would be on the other side of the fence, I would also be playing with the fact that we are not able to agree. We have a minimal consensus when it comes to issues like, for example, sanctions, where at least we're able to, to extend them every once in a while. But when it comes to having a, using a word which Amanda was using with respect to Turkey, a strategic vision as to how our relationship should be with respect to Russia, we don't have it. And again, the new German government won't make things easier. Because it's not only that they will have a different position vis-a-vis -vis Erdogan, but they also have a different position when it comes to Putin. And so that will make the situation among the EU27 even more complicated and less of a readiness to find a strategic vision on how to deal with Russia in the long term. Amanda, a reaction to that, and then I'll bring Fabian and Corinna in. Yeah, I mean, I think that the Russians, they're trying to take advantage of this, you know, difficult um, situation that we find ourselves in because of the energy spike and the and the costs are. But I mean, the Russians certainly don't have the same sort of leverage they had over um, EU energy policy back in 2000. Um, and six in 2009, and that's because the EU have carried out um, a great deal of energy reform regulation, and they diversified their, their sources and their routes. Um, but still, you know, Putin is never one to miss an opportunity, right? Um, so he is trying to use this as a way to push ahead with um, getting Nord Stream 2 online. Um, this would be a serious strategic mistake from the side of the EU or, or, the, or that member state um, who would actually be um, responsible for taking that decision. I mean, the goal here is supposed to be reducing our dependence on Russia. I mean, part of the problem is that, you know, the fact that we are using less coal uh, and less nuclear has mean, means that we've had to use more gas. Um, that's that's the sort of outcome. But I mean, yeah. for, from the EU's pers perspective, I mean, the way out of this, I mean, apart from having a coherent and common energy policy, as was just referred to by Yanis, is continuing to implement this, you know, energy transition. Absolutely. This is going to take some time. Um, but also looking at other sources of gas. I mean, we can talk here again about, you know, Caspian energy. Um, okay. it's, possible, it's possible to get new reserves um, from there, but certainly not giving in to the Russians and saying, OK, we're going to take more of your gas or we're going to start Nord Stream 2. This would be a, a huge error. Thank you. Very quick reactions from Fabian and Corinna, because I do want to have time to talk about the most serious of the issues facing our direct neighbourhood at the moment, uh, the situation on the Belarusian border. Fabian. I think just briefly, I, I think all of this just highlights that you can't co compartmentalize these issues, um, mm -hmm. that it's impossible to look at policy in individual parts. Uh, and uh, I think this is also a difficulty at the European level, because then you very quickly get into the competence question. And uh, is it the member state? Is it the European Union? Um, but we can't deal with uh, Russia, with um, energy, with Turkey, with migration. Um, in separate ways. Uh, we have to actually look at these together and come up with a strategic vision of what we actually want to achieve uh, combined um, between all of the member states. And at the moment, we're failing to do that. Thank you. Corinna, did you want to add anything before we move on? Well, not on this, but on the previous point re regarding uh, um, the expectation of the EU to have pro-reform and pro-European counterparts in the countries aspiring to join. And I think that that's, that's all great and it's desirable, of course, but we shouldn't forget what happened in the case, for instance, of, no of North Macedonia recently, where we had such a change in government and the, 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 the new government had done everything that was requested of it, including changing the name of the country, but the EU forgot that this is a two-way 
street and that you know irrespective of who is at the other um and the member states also have the responsibility to stick to pre-agreed uh, procedure and uh, and 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 processes and to deliver on their promises thank you very much amanda i want to come to as i say what is probably the most pressing and difficult issue right now uh, for the European Union, and that's the situation on the Belarusian border, uh, where a flood of refugees are coming across. We have had yesterday, um, it looked as if Belarusian authorities, armed authorities, were actually escorting people to the border. Warsaw has now sent 12,000 troops to the border. Accusations flying from the EU that Belarus is doing this deliberately uh, in order to retaliate over sanctions. Um, where do we go from here? It seems the situation is escalating all the time uh, and it's hard to see how it can be de-escalated. How do you see the situation now and the prospects? I mean, first of all, I mean, there's no question that this tyrant in Minsk is doing this on purpose. I mean, he's bringing in hundreds, if not thousands of people um, from the Middle East to purposely push them um, across the border, which is, you know, absolutely shocking. Uh, and I think the pictures that we're seeing on the Polish border, I mean, they're also shocking. I mean, they give a very bad image of Europe, first of all, because you, you see these huge barbed wire fences, um, hundreds of migrants on one side trying to cut their way through it. Uh, and then the Polish troops uh, on the other side, letting off tear gas and trying to push them back um, and whatnot. I think Poland's been put into, put into a very difficult situation, not just Poland, actually Lithuania um, as well. Um, so far, I mean, the EU has put sanctions on, um, on Belarus. I think we're in the fifth or the sixth round. Um, this hasn't had any impact, and that's not surprising because, I mean, the guy's not interested in listening to anything that the EU or the Americans or anybody else has to say. He's only interested in staying in power um, and is able to do that thanks to the support of his friend in the Kremlin. Um, but Poland so far seems to be resistant to um, support from from the EU. I mean, as far as I'm aware... Why is EU... that? I mean, the EU, Frontex, the EU has said, let us help, let Frontex, our border agency, help you. And Poland is, for the moment, saying no. Why? I mean, I'm guessing probably there may be some concerns from the Polish side that they could end up with um, many of these people um, being granted asylum inside Poland um, or something along those lines. This is something that Poland doesn't want. Um, that's why they're trying to handle the crisis themselves, but I mean, it, it's it's going from bad to worse. Um, I mean, other measures that could be taken, I mean, it's possible that the, the EU can try and um, intervene with some of these third countries um, where the flights are actually leaving leaving from. Um, I've heard that now in, in Iraq, um, the government has ordered the embassy of Belarus to stop um, giving visas uh, to people wanting to leave. This could also be done with other countries. Um, something along those lines. Maybe, I mean, I've heard that Commission President von der Leyen has talked about putting um, or sanctioning um, airlines for bringing um, these individuals. Mm. I mean, that might be, that, that would be, you know, quite a tough, a tough step, quite frankly, and, and, very, and very difficult for the, for the airlines in question. But I mean, obviously, I think Poland needs to be ready to, uh, to cooperate more um, instead of trying to fight this battle itself, because it's damaging um, the reputation of a country that already has a tarnished reputation um, when it comes to democracy and human rights, because when you see the Turk the Turkish, sorry, the, the Polish troops um, pushing back um, these poor people into Belarus, I mean, this is in direct um, violation um, of, of human rights. Um, and they need to, to, this needs to be borne in mind. This also reflects very badly on the EU. Absolutely. We are almost out of time, but Yanis, you wanted to make a quick point. Just three quick politics points. One is, this is not the first time that we're seeing these kind of pictures on the borders of Europe. Um, and in many ways, we also want to collectively send out these signals so that people will not even try to come. Another mistake which we are committing, and that has to do with migration policy. Second political uh, remark is that let's not forget the internal politics of all this. Um, the opposition in Poland has a different view of how the situation should be treated. And the current government is using the situation also in order to score internally in, in Polish politics. And third political point, let's not forget that there's also a link to the rule of law discussion which we're having. And that is a potential 
element in a complex domino where the current Polish government might think that it has something of a leverage to use against those who are pushing for a stronger rule of uh, law regime vis-a-vis -vis Warsaw, the current government in Poland and others. So as always, all these issues inextricably intertwined. Thank you all very much. I wish we had much longer, so much more to talk about, but thank you very much for a great discussion. Uh, that's all we have time for today. If you haven't read it already, please do take a look at Corinna's commentary, which as I say, was published yesterday and is on the EPC website. Uh, entitled EU Enlargement to the Western Balkans. And among many events coming up, next Tuesday, uh, we were talking about China and COP26 a little bit earlier, the future of EU-China relations with Ambassador Zhang Ming, who is head of the Chinese mission to the European Union, should make for some interesting listening. And I'll be back with Fabian and Yanis on November the 19th for our next EPC update. Thank you very much for joining us and have a good day. Bye.